Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the privilege of being able to be here in church today. In the United States of America, we have that freedom. And Lord, I pray that you'll always help us to avail ourselves of this wonderful privilege and blessing. But Lord, we're here not just to go through the motions, we are here to learn. Because in all actuality, America and uh, this blessed land is not going to be where we're going to live forever. Our citizenship actually is in heaven. And so, Father, I pray that you'll help us to learn these things so that we might prepare to be there. In the name of our Savior, amen. This is uh, number five in a study that uh, we have called Operation Footstool. We're answering a, a whole lot of questions in this study, and because uh, I wanted to try to bring some folks uh, up to date and also answer a question as sort of a rabbit's trail study, we're going to talk about the subduing of death. That was the question. How in the world can you talk about death being subdued? Well, Jesus Christ has uh, seven enemies. And he has to subdue all of them, literally, uh, to, to keep them from functioning, to keep them down, uh, to incarcerate them, to subjugate them under his feet. That's what Operation Footstool is all about. Now, one of those enemies, the last, the most dreaded, the most powerful, the greatest, is death. But now, uh, because most usually, people um, come to, to talk about death in only one way, physical death. Somebody has died. You go to the funeral home. You send them flowers and so forth. And that is the only type of death that is spoken of. But actually, there are about seven types of death that one day we will go over uh, in the Scripture. There's spiritual death, for example. There was spiritual death before there was physical death. It was because man died spiritually first that he dies physically second. And there is also an eternal death, which is, as the soul is separated from the body in physical death, the soul and body are separated from God in, in, um, in the second death forever. Now that's where we're headed, but um, before we get there, I had uh, some questions. Three times this past week, I had uh, questions about angels or comments about angels. And uh, my own chiropractor, uh, I was uh, laying there on uh, his uh, couch and he began to move my bones and uh, give adjustments. I asked him, I'd pay him another $25 if he'd give me an attitude adjustment. He said he couldn't do that, but he could adjust everything else. But uh, that particular day, my attitude wasn't so bad. So uh, we went on, and he was talking about the fact that every time he flies, he asks God to dispatch his guardian angels to hold up the wings of the plane. And I said, well, Doc, I understand what you're talking about because uh, I don't like flying either. It's not so much that I'm not ready for death. It's just I don't like the splat there at the end when the plane goes down. But... Uh, it makes me uneasy, and I get, I get seasick, I get plain sick as well. So, uh, but I said, however, uh, that is a wasted, worthless prayer. She was taken back. What do you mean? Aren't the angels ministering spirits and so forth? And I said, yes, but where do you find those verses? Verses like, uh, be, be attentive because some have entertained angels unaware. We're in the book of Hebrews. I said, well, who's Hebrews written to? <laughs> Hebrews. Jews. Yes. For past dispensations, you had angelic manifestations. In a future time, during the tribulation period, you're going to have angelic manifestations. You're going to see angels, and, uh, and they are going to communicate with you. They're called herald angels, uh, and they're going to communicate with you. And uh, in some dispensations, they even became incarnate or like men. And uh, so that took him back. First time he was at a loss for words because he didn't know how to, to answer me. And again, he goes to a church which is non-dispensational in its approach. Everything is, well, what God wants us to know all the Bible. Yes, that's right. 
All the Bible is for, for our learning, but all the Bible is not for our applying. You have to understand it in light of its historic dispensation. Now, one of the things that you must understand is with regard to angels. And, and I know uh, today, everybody out there, you've got friends where you work, talking about angels and how they have a guardian angel. And you are going to be looked at as weird. <laughs> the scripture says, don't you believe the Bible? And I said, yes, I believe the Bible. But again, you are a dispensationalist if you say we're not under law, but under grace. What does that mean? Those portions of the Bible that the Apostle uh, Paul designates as the law, unless they are transdispensational truths and brought over by Paul, those portions of the Bible are non-applicable to you. This past week, did you have bacon and eggs? Did you eat a pork chop? and so forth? Did you eat, of all things, catfish from the Ohio River or what have you? Did you know that if you lived under the dispensation of law, you're not allowed to eat those things? Well, how come you ate them with impunity today? Because you're not under law, but under grace. Yes, but aren't those anti-pork chops verses in the Bible? Sure they are, but they are applicable to a theocratic people, Israel, and they have nothing to do with Gentiles in this dispensation. And it's simply because people do not rightly divide the word of truth. Now, the baptism, for example, water baptism, is it in the Bible? Sure it is. Was it once required? Absolutely. We can take you to the verses in the Great Commission, go into all the world, baptize it. But you go on the other hand, is water baptism for this dispensation? No. You go to the commissioning of Paul, and he lets us know, so does Christ, that Christ sent him not to baptize. And on and on you can go with things that are in the Bible that are non-applicable to grace age believers. Now, one of the biggies that has reared his head is the study uh, of angels. And uh, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, the three times. So I figured, well, now, this is not a coincidence. I better just simply remind everybody what the truth is. That's all I'm interested in. And uh, for some who would say, well, now, Pastor, wait a minute. I would ask you, when's the last time you saw an angel? You seen one? Oh, but they were angels unawares. Nonsense. The body of Christ, a different type of creative organism, is being formed in this dispensation that is higher in the, uh, the creative order than angels themselves. And angels do not become incarnate in this dispensation when the body of Christ is being formed. We are the aristocratic family of God, and once the completed canon of Scripture was given, you do not have angels seen on this planet or helping believers at all. Our protector guardian is the Holy Spirit, and we can go verse to verse to verse to verse. And those who are looking to angels to help them to guard them, to, to see them through, are looking to the wrong person of the Godhead. And most of the people who lo are looking to angels are people who are confused about the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in this age. They don't know how to be filled with the Spirit, and they don't know the Romans 8.28 principle. God works all things together for good to them who lo uh, love Him. And that is, loving him means learning and applying accurate doctrine. You don't love him if you do not learn the truth and live it. That is the way it is. Okay, so let's just look under the economy of Israel. There were angelic manifestations. Angels were everywhere under this, this administration. You come to Mount Sinai, and Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that the law was given. God was there, but the law was given by the disposition of angels. Uh, the, the promise to Moses was for the children of Israel. I'll give my angels charge over thee, lest at any time you'll dash your foot against a stone. Well, that promise becomes a, a, a very special when you're talking about Israel had to march about <laughs> 100 miles through a wilderness that was all rock. 
There wasn't much vegetation there. And uh, that they were going to make it from point A to point B, the promised land, Egypt to the promised land. And the angels were going to provide for them all the way over. Uh, Lucifer even quoted that verse out of context, took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, 400 some odd feet down to the Kidred Valley down below. He said, jump, he'll give his angels charge over. He said, wait a minute, uh, that verse doesn't apply like that. That's tempting the Lord. The Lord didn't tell me to jump, it's you, Lucifer. And that is a misapplication of that scripture. Lucifer quoted scripture out of context. Jesus Christ caught it and said, yeah, it's also written, you don't tempt the Lord your God. You know, jump off a 400-foot precipice and expect the angels to bear, bear you up. That's nonsense. So, uh, however, there were angels in this dispensation. This is the dispensation of law. Matthew 28, verse number 2. Mary, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. There was a great earthquake. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. Fear of him did uh, uh, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said to the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Okay? Two things about this with regard to the first two words. Number one, there was angelic manifestation at the tomb. There was angelic participation. They were coming to the tomb and the question was asked, how are we gonna roll away the stone? We're women, it took some big hefty men to roll that thing into place. How in the world are we gonna budge that stone? God answered them by an angelic manifestation and an angelic participation in history. He came down and he rolled away the stone for them. And time and again, when you're talking about Israel, and by the way, Jesus Christ was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again under the dispensation of law, not the dispensation of grace. Paul tells us that God was in Christ working the, the potentiality for grace at this point, but he did it all under law, not grace. He did not die under grace. Grace did not start for a year and a half later until Saul of Tarsus was saved. So we don't have the gospel of the grace of God until Jesus Christ revealed it to him at that point. This is law. So they were manifest under law. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we could go all the way back throughout that dispensation. Think of, <laughs> think of Balaam. And uh, first of all, the, uh, he was hidden in the wrong direction. He shouldn't have been there. And the angel appeared to the donkey only. And the donkey rammed his foot against the, the wall there several times. Balaam was, began talking to the donkey, and the donkey began, the angel let the donkey talk back to Balaam. And so there they are, uh, dumb and dumber, talk, <laughs> speaking to one another here on this road. And uh, all of a sudden, then the angel became manifest to Balaam and uh, began talk. So that's manifestation and participation. But you have never seen an angel like this. You have never done it, and you're not going to until you're raptured out. Uh, after you're glorified, you'll see angels, absolutely. But you will never see one in the dispensation of grace. It is a different dispensation, and um, we, we do not have God revealing himself or these beings to us in this dispensation. Now, if you want a good book on that, Sir Roger Anderson has written a book on the silence of God. Why in other dispensations do you have angels appearing and talking? God uh, and, and the Shekinah glory cloud and talking and so forth. But in this dispensation, all of a sudden, we don't have any vocalization of God or manifestation of these beings. Why? Because we live in post-canon conditions. The canon of scripture is completed and therefore, as the royal family of God, we get our instructions and enablement from the word of God through the spirit of God, period. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's important to understand that. Because if you keep looking to other sources to help you, that uh, God help you. That's all I have to say is because in actuality, we stand out as the gemstone of the creation of God. And because our dynamics are different we do not seek help 
from angels. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Now, the next thing that um, the angels did under the past economies were they became incarnate. They do not do it today. Now, here's what happens. Liberal religions take that verse from the book of Hebrews and say, if somebody comes to your door and they're shabby looking and they have their hand out and they're hungry, you better give them money because you'll never know you're entertaining angels unaware. What should you do? I'll tell him what, tell him what to do. If it's a guy, tell him, uh, uh, tell him, get a shave, get a bath, get a life, get a haircut, get a job, period. That's what you should do. Why? Because Paul says that's, that's the order of things in the dispensation of grace. If they are positive toward Bible doctrine, God will provide all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, I've been young. I'm old. I've never seen his seed forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's, that's it. Well, but isn't it an angel? No, a thousand times, a billion times. No, it's not an angel that's begging. It's not an angel coming to you that you can entertain unawares. They do not become incarnate in the dispensation of grace. They did prior, and they may in the, in the tribulation period, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. And if you, the thing to give them is the gospel. Because once they're right with the shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? want. So if the Lord is the one shepherding me, what is he going to do? He is going to provide for me through the, through the normal means uh, instead, of, um, instead of begging. That's, that is the, tr uh, the way things are. All right, but now incarnation. They did become incarnate. Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre. He lift up his eyes, verse 2, and three men stood by him, and he saw them. Uh, he even uh, uh, fetched, uh, verse number five, a morsel of bread uh, to help them. He made the cakes. Note the last part of verse number eight. They did eat, it says. Verse number 16, and the men arose up and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Now here's how we know that these men were angels. Verse number nine, uh, one of chapter 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. Uh, and um, they evidently were, were very good looking angels as they became incarnate there. They, verse three, ate with them. But the men of Sodom, verse four, uh, encompassed the house. And uh, we, verse number five says, bring them out that we might know them. That is have a sexual relationship with them. Now, angels could become incarnate in past dispensations. Where did the Nephilim come from? They came from the union of angels and women. What happened? Angels donned human flesh. Angels took, became incarnate. And uh, that is how they, uh, of course, um, uh, copulated with th these women and produced the Nephilim, which in, in, uh, uh, eventually produced the demons but they do not become incarnate in the dispensation of grace. That is absolutely a forbidden thing, and it's especially um, true because there is a great prohibition against this because a special type of flesh is being formed in this dispensation, and that is the body of Christ. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, and there will not be another angelic eruption without God violently, and I mean immediately and violently, taking issue with that thing. Now, he didn't under conscience because those were different circumstances. But genetic corruption was what was, was back there, and uh, that's what the flood was all about. He will not allow genetic corruption in this dispensation. Any potentiality of it will be met with his fury and his anger immediately. All angels, including the good ones, are not allowed to become incarnate in this dispensation. 
Now again, it's a, it's a lot of verses, a lot of study to go through, but I'm, but I'm trying to help us because we are bombarded with this thing. Of, oh, the angels are just floating around out there, just, just waiting so that we can call upon them and they'll come to our aid, and that is nonsense. They do not manifest themselves, they do not participate in history as they did in the past, and they do not become incarnate. However, they do do something that is um, similar to what they do to the church. Let's turn to 1 Peter. And that is they observe. Verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. This is 1 Peter 1 verse 10. Who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are reported to you, the gospel which the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Of course, this gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. But uh, there is a similarity. Their souls are saved, our souls are saved. It's all by the same blood of Christ. And so there is a similarity and a connection. But note the last part. Which things the angels desire to look into? And that is the word for rubberneck. Do you ever have a, a neighbor's doing something and your mom comes to the kitchen window there and she gets on her tippy toes and she looks out the window to try that That's rubberneck. wonder what they're doing. Well, what's she doing now? And, and so forth. That's the word for uh, desire there. They rubberneck. Hey, man, that's, that's salvation. That is really something. They observe. But it's a behind-the-scenes observation uh, of the application of salvation um, and, and the procuration of it as well to Israel. But now let's go to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. Now, what I'm saying here to, to us is, is simply this. Uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Is that we should be spending our time cultivating the relationship with the filling of the Holy Spirit rather than attempting to get angels to do some things for us. Cultivating uh, he's our power source and he is our protector. Cultivating a relationship with him. Learning how to be continually filled with the Spirit. Present tense verb uh, of uh, uh, pleroo. Continually be filled with the Spirit. That is the, the person of the Godhead we need uh, to cultivate a relationship with. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Talking about the mystery and the body of Christ. The one new man, verse number 15 of chapter 2, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church, by means of the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Now that again is a verse indicating angelic observation. What is God doing? Forming one new man out of Jew and Gentile, bond free, male and female, circumcision, uncircumcision, and so forth. Man, this is a fantastic thing. It's different than anything that's ever been done before. Uh, yes, Israel has salvation. Israel has their program. Israel has their blessings. But here is an agency that is united to Christ by spirit baptism and literally made flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and a Holy Spirit union. That is absolutely fantastic. What we are today is unlike anything any other believer will ever be. Oh, yes, they're saved. Yes, they're eternally secure. Yes, they'll be in eternity future. But they're not the church. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. And that is fantastic. And the angels, these principalities and powers, observe us. Because in actuality, we're going to replace them as rulers in the second heaven. But now let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 12. And again, a difference. 
Israel wrestled against flesh and blood. You go into the land, and the first people that they, they uh, met were the inhabitants of Jericho. What did they have to do with the inhabitants of Jericho? Wrestle with them. Subdue them. Remember we read in Joshua where he brought the five kings out uh, that inhabited the land, the Canaanite kings, and he made his men put their feet on their necks? That was flesh and blood. And he killed them. That's Operation Footstool under God's physical earthly program, Israel. But now, God's Operation Footstool for the church is mainly invisible. Now, sometimes we think it's people, but in actuality, it is angelic confrontation. For we, this is verse 12 of chapter 6, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, in high places. But this is all invisible. It is an invisible warfare. It is a battle for control of your mind. And that is where accurate doctrinal thinking comes in. You don't have accurate doctrine. You don't have the truth. And therefore, these angels win. God the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he only brings the truth to your remembrance, what you've studied. So what do these angels do? Try to keep you ignorant. Try to keep you out of fellowship. Try to keep you from thinking the truth to life. And that is called angelic confrontation. They do do that in this dispensation. But you have never, ever, as he's coming down with his sword, grabbed his arm and, and, and tussled, there, uh, tussled this angel to the ground. You've never done that. You have never touched an angel except inwardly. So please understand that I think, I think that it's important because the Apostle Paul warns in the book of Colossians against worshiping angels. And that's where we are today in our society. That's what it's all about. But they are not even good angels that are being worshipped. They are the, the fallen angels uh, that are being paid deference to. Okay, let's, let's move on. And we're going to move to what we're calling anti-annihilation illustrations. Because we're talking about the subduing of death, we have to handle, and I had some questions about this. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Now, there are groups of people. I uh, think the, the Mormons, I even think the Seventh-day Adventists uh, sometimes uh, are this in some of their uh, churches, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the Worldwide Church of God, and so forth. They're what's called theologically as annihilationists. And they believe that what God does, and what hell is, is that God just simply takes a person and casts them into uh, the fire of hell, and they are burnt up. They're incinerated. They disintegrate. Uh, and it is um, it's something that happens uh, pretty quickly, uh, and that is called annihilationism. However, we are non- or anti-annihilationist. We believe that the judgment of God on the unbelieving angels and humans is an eternal judgment. It's something that goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, you say, well, how could a God of love do this? God of love doesn't do it. Those people that are in hell rejected his love and salvation through Jesus Christ. And now he's a God of justice. The people in hell are cosmic criminals and deserve to be there. They deserve to suffer because of what they did. They disbelieved the testimony of the Father regarding God the Son. And it's that sin, and that sin only, that sends a person deservedly to hell. The first person uh, and people to do it were Lucifer and his angels. The lake of fire was prepared for them originally. Man entered the angelic conflict, uh, he joined Lucifer, so he deserves to go there as an unbeliever, just like anybody else. Okay, now, so therefore you're familiar with this term, annihilation, 
anti-annihilation. Now, let's go through here, because we're talking about the subduing of death. Let's go through here and um, look how it is impossible that there, there's anything like uh, annihilationism taught in the scriptures. Uh, verse number 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. We'll stop right there. Where is, where are the bodies of this, uh, this um, beggar named Lazarus, we'll just put an L here, and uh, tradition calls this guy Dives. Where were the bodies of these two men? Well, obviously, they were six feet under. They were buried. That is the point. But now I want you to see something that just, just because they were buried, and this is another thing, like the uh, Jehovah's <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses believe in soul sleep. Uh, there's no such thing as soul sleep. Note what happened immediately. And, or excuse me, let's uh, back up to verse 22. The beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now you will remember that paradise or Abraham's bosom was in the heart of the earth until Jesus Christ led captivity captive and took these souls out uh, at the point of his resurrection. So for 4,000 years or better, all souls saved or not, except for those exceptions of Enoch, Elijah, Moses, and then, of course, Christ. All souls to that point in history were in the heart of the earth. So he was carried by the angels there. What part of him was carried? His soul was carried there. His body was in the tomb. The same thing with Dives or the rich man. And now notice, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Now, that the word there is the Greek word in. It means within, within hell, being in the very center of hell. Uh, he was not um, incinerated immediately. How do we know? Well, he's in hell and he lifts up his eyes. That takes some time, doesn't it? Not only does that take some time, but he says he is being in torments. The annihilationists say, oh, well, God is such a God of mercy, love and grace, that he is so merciful to these cosmic criminals that he throws them in the fire, they're burned up immediately, and there's vir virtually no pain. So uh, annihilationists believe in a painless hell. However, the scriptures are quite con to the contrary. In torments, the purpose of hell is to be tormented. And he's, I'm, I'm tormented. He saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He didn't cry uh, just before he was going to be thrown into hell. He cried in hell. He cried looking across a great gulf, as we'll see in, in a little bit. We'll write that in as well. Uh, and he saw him and they had a conversation. He was not annihilated. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice again, for I am tormented in this flame. He was not annihilated. He was there standing in hell in the midst of a flame and the flames were licking round about his soul. He didn't have his body. But still, you remember that the soul fits into the, to the central nervous system of the body, uh, hand in glove, male, male and female, and that sort of thing. And when the silver cord snaps, the soul is released, returns to, to, um, to God who made it. So uh, let's read on here. Besides all this, says Abraham, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Okay, so they're carrying on this conversation. Send him. He's not annihilated. He is being a torment. Father, would you send him? And, and Abraham said, can't do it. Here's reason number one. There's a great gulf fixed between us. 
You can't come over here, we can't come over there. If they were annihilated in an instant of time, why in the world would this guy be suffering? Why wasn't, he was in flame, he was in hell, he, he was tormented by the flame, and yet um, he couldn't get relief. I pray thee therefore, Father, that you'd send him to my father's house, lest they also come, verse 28, to this place of torment. It's not just a spot where somebody's thrown in and dissolved instantly. It is a place for ongoing torment. Okay. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Nay, Father Abraham, one went from the dead. They'll repent. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded that one rose from the dead. Send them back. Nope. They've got the word. Let them believe that. So, this is one of the anti-annihilationist illustrations. He was in hell, in flames, and he couldn't get out, and he couldn't get relief. It is a place designated for torments. And if the Greek language means anything, where, where you have the, uh, um, the uh, uh, word in, it means in or within. Now, to further illustrate this tr truth, we're almost out of time in th this hour, Come with me to um, the uh, book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse number 10. Well, let's go to verse 9. The third angel. Now, we just had our study about angels. This is the tribulation period. It is the final years of the dispensation of law. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, This is a herald angel. If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be, note that, Again, it's an ongoing present tense thing. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, not just for a brief time, but it ascends forever and ever. Why would you have the fire burning forever and ever if everybody's consumed in an instant of time? All unbelievers are gone like this. You, you wouldn't, but it's, it continues on. But now... Note, it says, and it, to specify the longevity of their torment, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image. So, it's a place of torments where it is unrelenting. Um, you know, you always hear those jokes where... Um, uh, and and it, it, is a, it is a sad thing uh, where they always say, well... Uh, you go to hell and you get a reprieve and you go to this room and it's the smoking room and this room, it's the drinking room, this room, it's the carousing room and so forth. And you get a 30 minute reprieve and what have you, then you go back and, and, and burn. You always hear that, but that is absolutely not true. There is no relief, no rest, day nor night. And um, not, not painting a very pretty picture here uh, this morning with regard to this, but please remember that um, for those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, Jesus Christ has set the prisoner free. We're not going to be incarcerated. We're not going there. And for anybody who believes in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they miss the place of torments. That's the good news. That's what the gospel is. And the, the, the thing to, to hand, the most merciful action that you could have toward individuals is giving them the gospel. Giving them temporary help is no good, unless, of course, associated with that is giving them the gospel. Because all you're doing is helping them perpetuate their evil status through their lifetime, go to hell, and what good did you do? You must get people the gospel, because it's only the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation from hell um, to everyone that believes.